So thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Louis Dion. I work at Apple. Uh, I work on libc++, which is the C++ standard library uh, shipped with Clang. And today we're going to talk about a, a topic that can seem a little bit boring at first sight, but it's actually really important, um, especially for those of you that need to care about the, you know, about ABI stability. Um, and so obviously we're, we're talking about ABI, right? So I'm going to start by explaining why, why you might care about about you know, keeping a stable ABI. And then I'm gonna transition over to uh, talking about a little bit what's the ABI, you know, uh, explaining a few things that are specified in the Ethereum C++ ABI just to give you an understanding, a better understanding of what's included in there. And then I'm gonna go over uh, how uh, changes in your source code can actually have an impact on um, what the ABI of your program or your library looks like. And then uh, I'm gonna give you a few tips for controlling your ABI surface, mostly through non-standard attributes. And finally, I'm gonna show a couple of tools that can be used to uh, look at your ABI surface or detect you know, ABI incompatible changes. And so as a quick disclaimer, um, I'm assuming here Unix and Ethereum C++ ABI, but uh, most concepts will transfer, so it should be useful for uh, folks that are on different platforms as well. So before we start, what's an ABI? Wikipedia says that an ABI defines how data structures and functions are accessed at a low level, you know, at a machine code level. In contrast, an API, which we all know about, defines how data structures and functions can be accessed at a, at a you know, human readable kind of level, at a high level. So they really have a parallel between each other. So I like to think of the ABI as being like the API, but for machine code, right? So it's gonna define things like how, um, what is the algorithm for the compiler calling a function? When you call a function in your code, you just say, you know, function name, friends, arguments, friends. That's it. Under the hood, the compiler actually has to do something. It has to put the arguments somewhere, either on the stack or on the registers, and, um, and you know, it needs to kind of have a way of passing the arguments to the colleague. So, so the ABI is what defines these kind of things. And so one reason why uh, ABI stability is important is um, because it allows you to distribute code, um, or rather to distribute binaries without having to distribute the code, right? Um, and it allows you to update these binaries without having to recompile all the dependence of, um, of your libraries. So kind of like, um, kind of like, an API break means that the compiler, the, rather the, the programmer, which is like a human compiler, needs to go and you know, change their source code in order to account for the new API, so they have some work to do there. Right? When you change the ABI, the compiler itself will have to do some work in order to um, adjust basically the, the binaries to the new ABI of the, the binaries that you just shipped. So I really like to think of API and ABI as being kind of the same thing, except they're um, for different customers. One of them is for the compiler, the other one's for the programmer, right? So obviously when you break the ABI, it means that you need to, um, need to rebuild all the dependence of um, the binary for which you broke the ABI, which is not always possible. Um, so there are some costs associated to ABI stability, of course, uh, just like there are some costs associated to API stability. So I like to, again, I like to put these like in, in, in parallel, really. Um, so namely, it's, it's harder to evolve libraries if you can't um, you know, break backwards compatibility for, for an API. Just the same is true for an ABI. So if, if you um, want to make, for example, performance improvements in a library and you cannot break the ABI, it can be kind of hard, right? It can be kind of hard to adjust your library to use the latest and greatest um, good practices, best practices, if you can't break the ABI as well. Um, but in some cases, like I said, it's impossible to break the ABI. For example, if you are shipping, uh, you know, dynamic libraries onto a device for which, um, and, and it's not possible to recompile the applications that linked against that dynamic library on the device. So an example of that is imagine there is a security vulnerability in some system shared library. Um, we'd like to issue a security fix and uh, by just replacing the shared library. If we're not ABI compatible with the previous library, 
will need to recompile basically all, to rebuild all the dynamic libraries in, on the system that you know, link against the one that we're trying to fix, and also all the applications, which in, in many cases is just not reasonable. So it's kind of the, it's not only about laziness of, uh, you know, I don't want to rebuild my code. Sometimes it's, it's not reasonable or possible to do so. In other cases, you're being vended libraries by a, a vendor that's not giving you the source code as well. So you just don't have the choice. Okay, so now that hopefully it's a little clearer why we might care about this topic, um, I want to go over a few things in this Itanium C++ specification, just to give you folks a better, you know, high-level understanding of what's that thing, right? Um, in, in particular, I want to make it clear that there's really no magic here. Um, just like C++ is specified in a standard that we can all read, it's just, you know, technical English. Uh, not, not the most fun thing to read, right? But it, we can all go and read it. The Ethereum C++ uh, specification is also just like an HTML document. It's available here in, um, on GitHub. And it's just technical English that describes how we do various things like passing arguments to a function and how we uh, lay out, you know, members in a, in a class and things like that. Um, and as any specification, it's just a convention that vendors decide to agree on. And not all vendors actually agree on, on, you know, on the uh, Ethereum C++ uh, API, but vendors that do will basically be able to produce uh, libraries that can interoperate with each other, given that they're using the same data structures, which implies using the, the same um, center library. And so as an example, um, let's talk about passing arguments to a function. So passing arguments in C is pretty simple because all structures, if you want to pass a struct by value, right, um, all structures are trivially copyable. So you just, you can just take it and you chop it up in, in registers and then eventually if it's too large, you put the rest on the stack and you just pass it to a function. And then the callee is going to know to use, um, to use basically the, the struct that way. In C++, it's not as simple though because we have copy constructors, we have uh, destructors, and so on. So in C++, um, the C++ Ethereum ABI says that basically for trivial types, we do the same thing as, as, as C does, right? Which is implied by the platform usually. Um, however, for non-trivial types, we have to allocate space on the stack, and then we, you know, the caller is gonna call the copy constructor, and then it's gonna pass the address to the object on the stack to the callee. Callee does whatever it wants, and then when it returns, the caller is gonna call the destructor. So it's just like a little algorithm, it's just a little convention that, that we establish in order for things to work. Hmm? Another example is laying out base classes. Um, so uh, when we think about laying out members and base classes, there is a bunch of questions that we can ask, like um, do we put the base class members before the derived class members, or the other way around, or in case of multiple inheritance, which obviously, like these questions, these questions, they don't come up in C because they don't have inheritance, right, or base classes. But so for C++, with multiple inheritance, do you lay them out from left to right, or from right to left, or you could be clever and possibly, you know, pack things, or there's a bunch of different choices. So again, the, uh, the ABI is where, the ABI specification that your vendor follows is basically where these questions are answered. So in the Ethereum C++ ABI, the way this works is basically that you lay out the base classes in declaration order, if you have any, and then you lay out the, um, the non-static data members, and then you end up with the, um, the virtual inheritance basically in the order that they appear in the, um, in the in inheritance graph. So the details here are really not important. I think what's important is just to get an understanding that when you type stuff in your code, there's machine code being generated. And the way this machine code looks in many cases, not all cases, but in many cases, is gonna be defined by the ABI. And again, this is where the EBO, uh, the empty base optimization takes place. So there's, um, there's basically a paragraph in the Itanium C++ ABI that says, hey, by the way, if, you, if one of your bases is empty, then you don't need to allocate storage for it, unless there is another base which has the same type, in which case the C++ standard says that they must have different addresses, and then you, know, you, you basically can elide the storage for only one of them. So this is where these kind of um, optimizations are implemented. Another example is name mangling. 
So name mangling refers to um, the way the linker and the compiler have to refer to an entity in your program, to a function in your program, right? So if, if, if you call a function, the compiler can emit a, an instruction basically saying, um, call foo, right? And the way it's gonna refer to foo here is really important. You want to refer to foo in a way that is unambiguous so that you know, if there's another foo in your program, you, you know which one to pick. In C, this is really easy because we don't have namespaces, we don't have overloading and so on. So um, a function named foo in C is just gonna be mangled as foo. In C++, it gets more tricky. Because we have overloading and namespaces and so on, if I just say call foo, you might not know which namespace um, it's in. You might not know which overload of foo that is. And so you need to somehow incorporate these, um, this the environment of the, of the function that you're calling into it, the name that gets generated, right? And so what we do in C++ is we incorporate, for example, the, the namespaces of, um, of the function and also the argument types of the function. And there's a bunch of other stuff, like whether it's a template and, and you know, all that stuff. So actually this brings me to um, an interesting, I think, uh, anecdote where I proposed a change for C++ uh, 17, I think it was, or 20. And it was to allow lambdas in unevaluated contexts. So basically they call type of a lambda. Because this used not to be allowed. And at first I naively, you know, said like, you know, it should be easy to implement, right? And Talking to implementers made me understand eventually that um, the ability to do decal type of a lambda could mean that the, that a lambda type appears in one of these names. And that would mean that we need to uniquely refer to, um, to that lambda. I mean, we, we'd be, we need to be able basically to mangle that lambda in some way such that if I have foo that contains the type of one lambda and foo that contains the type of a different lambda, they're mangled as different foos. That means basically mangling the body of the lambda, which is arbitrary C++, right? So um, I think understanding, at least for me, under, understanding like name mangling a little bit better and what's implied, you know, what, why it's there, um, really opened my eyes to basically uh, why some things in C++ can be done and why some things can't be done, right? So we ended up, you know, allowing lambdas in unevaluated contexts, but in, in, you know, restricted cases to make sure that they couldn't appear in these names because nobody wants to implement an algorithm for mangling arbitrary C++ you know, statements. And so there's a bunch of other things, um, like the layout of V tables, the layout of RTTI, how exceptions are handled. These are all described basically in the, um, in the C++ ABI, right? And your vendor, uh, for example, Clang and GCC um, uh, do have the uh, Ethereum C++ ABI. MSVC uses a different ABI, um, and so, you know, they, they can basically uh, choose what ABI they, they, um, they want, but if you want to be able to interoperate between two different libraries, they have to use the same ABI. So that's, that brings me to a, a, a naive definition of what ABI stability is. So for me, ABI stability, in the context of this talk, this talk um, ABI stability is that software compiled with one version, against one version of a library, doesn't need to be recompiled in order to um, use the new library, basically. So this is a little bit narrow as a definition, but it, you know, I think it works for the purposes of this talk. And so now that we have a definition for ABI stability, let's take a look at how we can break it, which is surprisingly easy. So I'm gonna start with um, a very simple example. I have a point struct here with two integers, right, two members. And then I have, and that's defined in the headers. And then I have a function that returns a vector of these points, and that's defined in a shared library. And then I have an application that links again that share, against that shared library, and just basically gets a trajectory, so it gets a vector of, of these points, right, from the shared library, and it does something with them. Here we're printing them, but it doesn't really matter. So that's a really, really simple setup, right? Um, now, imagine that we update the library, like my coworker comes and they're like, ah, you know, I have this awesome idea. Points could be like either two-dimensional or three-dimensional point, right? That's great. So, so they come in and, and they make that change, right? So, forgetting the fact that this is a horrible API, um, 
it's also a problem you know, from an ABI standpoint. Even though some, some people might think it's not because I'm adding this, the, the member at the end of the struct, it actually is, right? Because um, you could think this is not a problem because if I look at the beginning of the struct, it's still a valid struct in the V1 world, right? But because I'm returning a vector here, I'm, um, in the vector, the points are gonna be laid out one you know, beside the other. And if I add a member even at the end of the struct, that's gonna change the layout basically as far as the vector is concerned. So if you make that change, uh, so if you make that change and you rebuild the application, or rather if you rebuild the shared library but not the application in this case, um, the application thinks that it's getting x, y, x, y, x, y, and so on. However, the shared library was recompiled against a new definition of point. So now it's getting x, y, and then optional z, right? And so when the application tries to access some of the coordinates in the vector, it's sometimes gonna read basically the member for the optional z, and that's gonna be garbage. So that's pretty simple. I think most people are probably following at this point. And the tricky part here is that you're not getting in any linker error. You're not getting a compiler error. You're just getting a runtime error, if you're lucky. And if you're really unlucky, your, your program will run, and it's just gonna give you, you know, garbage results. So let's take a look at the different example. It's the same setup here. I still have my point. Still returning a vector of those. Um, and then the application is the same as well. However, in uh, the second version of the library, I just reorder my X and my Y. Okay, so here I didn't change the layout of the struct. I didn't change its size, its alignment. I didn't change anything, except I changed its semantics. And that's also really important, because now the application, if you run it against the new dialib, the new shared library, and you don't you know, rebuild the application, it's gonna get a vector of points laid out as y, x, y, x, y, x. But really it thinks that it's still getting x, y, x, y, x, y. So it's probable that your program is gonna run it's probably not gonna give you the right results. In this case, we're, we're basically like rotating the plane, right? And there's no way to know about these kind of changes. And so these changes were, like I think it's obvious for most people here. If you know a little bit of, you know, a few things about ABIs, you know that these were like really bad ideas, right? Really, really bad ideas. However, let's take a look at a much more subtle way that you can break the ABI, right? Some changes are really subtle, and here's an example from libc++. So we have this thing in C++ called pair. It's beautiful, it's short like that, right? No, in reality there's like 18 constructors and it's terrible, but the point is, that's the gist of it, right? It has two members, first and second, has few constructors, um, and it has basically, and in our version of libc++, I mean, in, you know, a while ago in libc++, we had a, a, an empty destructor like that, right? And eventually we said, hey, because the destructor is empty, we might as well just default it, right? I mean, there is no difference here. Um, so this is just a better style. So just, you know, C++11, we love that, right? So now consider this. And there is no magic trick here. Imagine I have a shared library that has a function that takes a pair of integers, okay? And I have an application that just creates a pair and calls the function in the shared library with that. There really is, like, there's nothing hidden here. Just a shared library passing a pair as part of its ABI, and then the application passes it. What happens? Well, the problem is, if you rebuild the if you rebuild the, um, the, the shared object, or rather, if you rebuild the application with the new definition of pair, and the shared library is using the, first defi the, the old definition of pair, the library, the shared library, is not expecting the, um, the pair to be trivial. Because what happened is, and between these two code samples, whether you are Def you are defaulting, explicitly defaulting um, the pair destructor or actually just having a, an empty destructor like that changes whether the, the pair of ints is considered trivial for ABI pur purposes, okay? So here, a pair of int is not trivial. 
here, a pair of int is trivial. And so what happens now is that in one case, in one case the pair gets passed in the registers, and in the other case it gets passed on the stack. Right? So the application is ex the application is, is is expecting is basically putting the thing on, this, on the um, in the registers if it's been compiled against the, the newer version where it's trivial, right? And then the shared library is expecting it on the stack, or the other way around, if you depending on what you rebuild. So we had we actually had that problem, and um, angry users, right? So so this is pretty nasty. Like imagine if you before you make a change of that sort. You had to think about it. This is really annoying. Um, and it actually showcases an important misconception that is widely spread in the C++ community. And it is that header-only libraries don't need to care about ABI. If you notice here, from my perspective, I'm the libc++ guy, right? From my perspective, all I'm doing is I'm giving you a pair, which is full of metaprogramming. It's in a header. And it doesn't have any component in the library, in the shared library, or in a static library, or anything like that. So I changed that. However, what I need to take into account is that my users, in this case, the you know shared library and the application, might actually have my types that are defined in the headers. They might have these types as part of their ABIs. And so, because of that, I need to make sure that all the changes I make are not gonna break their ABI. So whenever we make a change, and this is a very real thing, whenever we make a change in libc++ today, we have a code review, and then there is a Marshall, Eric, and I just go over all the changes, and we try to break it in any way we can. We're like, okay, what if a user put that type in a shared library, and then they build it with like that setting, and then this other application over there was built, and that's, you know, other, other way, basically. Am I breaking their ABI through my headers? So you have to always think about that. And it's a little bit of a nightmare, um, but it's something to be, it's definitely something to be aware of. If you're not aware of that, and you've been vending um, library, uh, libraries to users, it is quite probable that you've broken the ABI without even knowing it. Because you have to be very aware of that. That brings me to a second common misconception, is that all ABI issues are solved with static libraries. I get that a lot, right? So people come and say, yeah, why, why do you even bother with Dylan, right? Like, why, why do you care about shared libraries? There is such a mess, and you know, just ship everything, static libraries everywhere, we're happy. Well, it turns out this isn't quite true. Um, and it's, actually, I think that static libraries are even much, much, um, much harder to get right. So let's take a look at that. Imagine I have a header-only library, foo.hpp, okay? It just has a foo function, it's an inline function defined in the headers, returns two. Simple. Then I have a static library bar um, that uses my, my, my header-only library to provide a function called bar. And then I have an application that uses both of them, okay? So it, it makes a call, uh, in the, uh, to the function that's defined in the headers, and it also uh, it links against the static library, and it makes a call to bar, okay? So if we compile that, we end up with something along those lines here. Basically have a libbar.a that contains uh, foo and bar, and it does contain foo, because even though it's an inline function, I mean, if, if you turn off optimizations, obviously, right? Um, if, if you have optimizations enabled and you see that, uh, your compiler's wrong, right? I mean, you, Make, make a complaint to your, uh, to your vendor for sure. But, so you have foo here because you, you referred to it. So you, you do emit the inline function in the object file. And then obviously you emit bar. And then in main, in the object file for your application, you will also have an, in, an instantiation of foo because you also call, made a call to it. So you also get your own instantiation of foo. And then you get your instantiation of main as well. And then what's gonna happen is the linker takes your object files and it's gonna basically, it's gonna take bar, it's gonna take main, and then it's gonna see there's two foos. And it's gonna pick one of them. And the reason why it's allowed to just pick one of them, basically at random, um, is because there's something called the ODR in C++, the one definition rule. Essentially what that says 
is that in a valid C++ program, there must be one and exactly one definition of each function. And so because of that rule, the linker says, ah, I know this is a valid C++ program. If it's not, I, I can do whatever I want anyway, right? So assuming this is a valid C++ program, I know that these two foos have the same definition. They must have because of the ODR. So it just picks whichever it wants, okay? So that's basically how that works. Now, imagine the header-only library makes a very tiny, you know, tiny change. It still has the same contract, it still has the same signature, it's almost the same, but it has a slightly different implementation, okay? And now you rebuild the application, but you don't rebuild the static archive. What happens? Well now, libbar, I mean libbar stays the same, but now your, your main object file has the new definition for foo, which comes from the new headers, right? And it still has main. And now the linker, when it tries to select one of the two foos, it assumes the ODR, so it assumes that they have the same definition, but they don't. I mean, okay, they're equivalent, but they're not strictly speaking the same. So that's an ODR violation, right? So in, technically speaking, this is undefined behavior. This program could behave completely di differently from the previous one. And so we like to call these kind of ODR violations benign ODR violations because they're benign, right? Um, for example, it's the kind of thing that I can, I can kind of do in libc++, right? Because I'm good friends with the linker folks, so I know they're not gonna you know, mess with me. But, um, but technically speaking, if we're pedantic, this is like undefined behavior. And so this is really tricky because the header-only library, I might not even be aware, like maybe bar is something that I got, it could be like a boost library, it could be something that I got from someone just giving me a, you know, a static archive. I might not even know that they're using the foo library, the header-only library, in their implementation as an implementation detail. Maybe I'm not even aware of that, right? And independently of that, I decide to go and fetch the header-only library and use it in my code and now I'm exposed to this, to this problem. So this is, this is very, very tricky. So distributing static libraries is something, it is something for which you have to be really, really careful because you have to understand these kind of things. And um, in this case, the problem could have been prevented by basically the header-only library never changing the definition of foo, understanding that you know, one of, it, of their users might, might have been shipping a static archive, which is, which is not really great. I'll show some ways that we can actually avoid that um, later on. So if you're not too depressed at this point um, with how difficult it is to maintain a stable ABI, I do have um, general guidelines, right? Because there are some things that we can do um, to, to our source code basically that are not gonna break the ABI. So, so it's not the end of the world, really. This is obviously non-exhaustive. Uh, and you should totally take a look at the KDE ABI guidelines and also the Android uh, ABI stability documents, uh, which you know provide a really really nice overview of what you can and mostly what you I mean what you can and can't do basically you know to a library in order to maintain ABI stability. So there's a few things that are safe. First, you can add a new non-virtual function. You cannot add a new virtual function because that would add an entry in the V table. And that can change the layout of the V table. So that doesn't work. But you can add a new non-virtual function, no problem. Another thing you can do is add a new enumeration to a class. That's basically just a front-end thing, right? Um, and you can also append new enumerators to an enumeration, but you have to be careful about the underlying type, right? So what happens normally with uh, enumerations is that the compiler is gonna pick an underlying type for you, right? And it's free to pick basically anything it wants as long as all the enumerators fit in, you know, uh, given the representation of the underlying type. So if you add a bunch of enumerators, eventually that could cause the compiler to bump to a larger underlying type. And in that case, you will have, you know, a different representation and that's an ABI break. So as long as you keep basically the same underlying type, you're okay. So uh, in C++, uh, I think this was added in 11, 
um, you can actually specify the underlying type explicitly of the enumeration. So it's a great idea to do that. Um, otherwise, in C++ Total Tree, I think some people um, basically added an enumerator at the end that was like a dummy enumerator that has a, had a like really large value, and that would force the compiler to use um, a pretty you know, large type. And then you know that you could add enumerators in between whatever you were using before and that very large value. So these are kind of tips that you can use. Another thing that is safe is um, to define an inline function out of line. Um, however, it must be okay for the program to call any of these uh, of the versions of the, the, the function. And the reason is, when you have an inline function, it can, it doesn't have to be, but it can be boiled into you know, an executable because the optimizer sees that, it, the optimizer is like, well, you know, it's a small function, I'm just gonna boil it right here. Um, so you don't know whether existing programs are actually making a call into your library or not. So if you take an inline function and you put it in your library, you have to be comfortable, you have to be, like the program has to be correct whether it calls the previous instance of the function or the one that you just put in your library. So we're walking a pretty thin line here. And then you can add stuff, generally speaking. I mean, not, you know, member, uh, not, not, you can add like data members, but you can add static data members. That's fine, it's just like adding globals, basically, right, global variables. And you can add new classes, that's cool too. Uh, you can do whatever you want with friends declarations, because those are just a front end kind of thing in the compiler. They don't really have an impact on, on the ABI. So that's safe too. And pretty much everything else is unsafe. There's a few other things that you can do, but really you can't do much more, right? Um, if you're willing to, if you're willing to, you know, play a game with like benign ODR violations, you can change implementation, like functions that are implementation details in a way that they're still functionally equivalent, but not actually, you know, they don't have the same implementation, but they have the same contract basically as, as previously. You can do that, so you, that way you're getting like benign ODR violations, but it, you know, it's kind of fine, but you're walking a very thin line here. It's, it's, it's kind of tricky. So there's a few ways that you can control your ABI. Um, unfortunately, we don't have as many tools as, um, as we'd like, really, but we do have you know, a, a handle on a couple of things here. So first of all, we can use inline namespaces. Inline namespaces do help a little bit. So an inline namespace is basically a namespace that um, isn't really part of your API because it's transparent as far as the, you know, as the source code is, is concerned, you can say std pair, you don't have to say std v1 pair, for example. And this actually is the case, by the way. In libc++, everything you're accessing today is actually std colon colon under bar under bar one colon colon whatever you're accessing, right? So we have this inline namespace in place um, to account for potential ABI changes. So it's, it's there, it exists from the ABI standpoint because it's gonna get mangled in the name of the type or the function or whatever appears basically in the, um, in the inline namespace, but from the API, it's transparent. And so the idea is, say I have this non-trivial version v1 of pair, right? And then I change it to being trivial or I make any other ABI incompatible change. I bump my, name, my inline namespace. And because now they have different names, if I um, actually try to link an application, you know, that expects, a, say, a, um, no, a trivial version of pair, so a v2 version of pair, against a library that's been compiled, you know, five years ago that has the old definition of pair in it, um, that one is gonna actually refer to v1, pair v1. So I'm gonna get a linker error. The, the linker is gonna say, oh, this function here, you think, it, you think it accepts a pair v2, but really it was compiled and it, it accepts a pair v1, right? So that's a linker error, which is much, much better than having you know, like a runtime error. But it's not foolproof. Like it's, it's not 100%, you know, it doesn't work like 100%. Um, the reason is because the mangling is not viral. And what I mean by that is that basically the mangling of the inline namespace of std pair, for example, is not going to be reflected in the mangling for any class that might use std pair. Right? And so 
uh, let's say I have my point class here, uh, which has you know coordinates as a as a pair of ints basically, um, and I have a uh, function that returns a point from from a shared object. Well, the the problem is that the mingling of point is actually just going to be point, right? It's not like it's not going to know that it's using v1 or v2. So in that case, I'm not I'm not actually being protected against uh, against ABI breaks. So it does give you some amount of you know of protection, but it's it's not really perfect. In theory, I think what we'd want is for, I mean, not what we'd want, but in theory, if, if we wanted to be 100% safe, we need the mangling of each type to contain things like the, um, its, you know, its bases, um, its members, I mean, the type of, their, of its members, their order, um, the, I mean, a bunch of things like the settings, the com some of the compiler settings under which it was compiled, right? And so you'd bake all that in the mangled names, you'd get some big monster that would, that would uniquely identify you know the ABI for that type, but obviously we don't we don't do that. Um, I don't know whether it would be a good idea. Probably not. Um, but uh, in theory, this is what we'd want. So inline namespaces are an okay are an okay solution. They're not perfect. I still recommend that you use them. Um, they will you know uh, save you some headache, but don't don't expect them to to solve all the problems. Basically, is what I'm saying. So another thing you can do is um, control so. One thing you can do actually much more easily is control the ABI surface, right? If you have a fairly small ABI surface, then there's you know, less risk that you're actually gonna get into trouble. Um, unfortunately, this does not protect you against uh, you know, reordering members or, or things like that, but it does uh, protect you against like, removing a function that's for some reason someone was using from your shared library. So I like to differentiate between two things. The first one is symbol visibility, um, which is for dynamic libraries. And so a symbol visibility refers to basically whether um, a function in your library will be accessible from outside the shared library. So whether someone, like an application or another library that links against your library, whether it can actually refer to that function in your shared library. So if it, is, uh, if it has hidden visibility, then it cannot. The library is like private, if you want, to the shared library. If it has default visibility, um, then it can. It is visible from the outside. So you can use uh, something like uh, attribute visibility hidden, which is supported by at least GCC and Clang. Um, you can use this attribute and apply it to the functions that you want to hide basically from your, from your uh, ABI surface. Okay. However, that can be a little bit uh, viral because most of the time we have a very limited set of things that we want to expose and there's a lot of things that we don't want to expose. So it's kind of the wrong default in my opinion. So one thing I like to do instead is compile with dash f visibility equals hidden. So that compiler flag, which is at least supported by Clang and GCC again, that compiler flag um, actually makes the default visibility and makes it hidden. So everything's hidden by default. So you don't have anything in your in a visible from outside your shared library. And then you can actually go and cherry pick by using the um, attribute visibility default you can cherry pick basically um, functions that you want to be available from outside your shared library. So I think that's a much saner default. And obviously there is like equivalent you know, um, techniques for DLLs. Um, now there's a question of whether these kind of attributes uh, will be standardized under some form or another. Uh, there's been attempts to doing that. Um, I believe Isabella, who's here this week, I think, uh, tried to um, standardize some of that. And also I think Anthony Polukin had a, um, had a proposal for that. And so far, these proposals haven't been too successful. Um, I think the problems are that the you know, platforms vary you know, quite wildly in how they handle that. And, um, and so there wasn't, I think, a, a very strong consensus on the committee about how to solve these problems. So for the time being, I think we're, we're pretty much stuck with um, uh, compiler specific attributes. But these, at least these uh, attributes are, are supported by Clang and GCC, so it's not too bad. Now, so the first thing I talked about was visibility. Now I wanna talk about something slightly different. It's linkage. And so visibility is for shared libraries. 
linkage is kind of like visibility, but for static libraries, okay? And so linkage here um, basically refers to whether uh, the definition of a function is going to be private to a translation unit. Just like visibility refers to whether a, a symbol is gonna be private to a shared library, linkage does that at a translation unit or like object file kind of level. And so you can give uh, on Clang, I, I don't know whether GCC supports that attribute, but Clang does, and so you can use the attribute internal linkage um, to um, basically give the equivalent of a static keyword to almost any de uh, declaration in your program. And so it's a little bit like um, putting that function in a uh, anonymous namespace, in other words. So what happens there is un um, unlike the previous example I had with the header-only library that had, you know, foo was basically in two different translation units, and then the linker would pick one of them. Um, if you give internal linkage to your function, there's gonna be one copy in each translation unit. But the linker will not pick one of them. Each copy will be local to the translation unit. The code in each translation unit is gonna use their own version of the, of the function, and you're gonna end up with basically two private copies of foo in your end executable. So this, this allows for, I mean, basically this gets rid of the pitfall that I uh, explained earlier where you're changing some, some stupid implementation detail you know, in your library and then you're, you, you get an ODR violation. So this gets rid of the ODR violation by making it private to each translation unit. This has the obvious downfall though, that now you're duplicating potentially lots of code, right? Because each time that you refer to a function that has static linkage in a translation unit, you get a copy of that function. So if you refer to the same function over and over again in, in different translation units, even if they potentially could be deduplicated by the linker, they will not be. So you end up with potentially some code bloat. So unfortunately, there is a cost to that for sure. Now, another thing that is not trivial to do today, but you can do, is control uh, the visibility of your vtable and RTTI and control where it gets emitted. So the way you do that today is basically by applying a visibility attribute to, to the class, and then you can define what we call a key function. So the key function is basically a, a virtual function that isn't defined in the header, and that is defined in exactly one translation unit. Okay, and so um, basically the compiler will, by this Ethereum C++ ABI, the compiler will know that there's, um, when it sees rather the definition of the virtual function in a translation unit, it will emit the vtable, and hence the RTTI as well, uh, exactly there, right? So that's a way of, of knowing exactly where your uh, vtable and RTTI are, are instantiated. And then by controlling the visibility on your class like that, you can also control somewhat the um, visibility of your vtable. That's unfortunate a little bit though because um, you can use, uh, because using the visibility attribute on the class like that will actually impact also the other functions in the class. So if you have like private implementation details, for example, in your class that you would rather not make visible outside your shared library, um, unfortunately this attribute will also apply to them. So Clang has a type visibility attribute that you can use, which solves that problem. It just basically, um, it will only affect, so the type visibility attribute will only affect the visibility of your vtable. Um, so that's also something you can look into if you're interested. So I had um, a proposal, which um, is you know, making steady progress, um, but it, I don't know exactly what, what's gonna happen with it, but the, um, the idea was to be able, being able to refer explicitly to the vtable of, of a class, basically. And that will allow more explicitly um, you know, the, deciding where the, uh, the vtable gets instantiated and then applying attributes directly to the vtable. So in the header, for example, you just say, I have my class widget, it has a virtual function. You can decide to define your virtual function right here or you can define it elsewhere. It doesn't really matter. Um, like you don't need to define it ex in exactly one TU at that point, right? And then in exactly one translation unit, you go and you say, widget colon colon virtual, and that is equivalent to a, um, like an explicit instantiation of a template, right? It kind of forces the compiler to emit the vtable in that translation unit, right, right where the uh, keyword appears. 
Um, and then because we have a way of, like a syntax for, um, for, for mentioning the vtable, then we can also apply different attributes to the vtable more easily than, than by going through, the, you know, through an attribute on the type itself. So I think it's a tiny proposal. I kind of like it. We'll see how that goes with that. But yeah, I'm hopeful that eventually we'll get it. Another thing that is interesting with this is that you could potentially say extern widget colon colon virtual, and then you can make sure that the, the um, just like if, when you declare an, a function as extern, right, you can make sure that the compiler is not even gonna um, emit like a vtable in each translation unit. Um, it, can, it basically will know because of the extern declaration that there's one in exactly one place where it is defined. So it doesn't have to um, emit the vtable in each translation unit, which is what happens if you just um, define your virtual functions in line in your class, then you basically get one vtable in each translation unit, and then the linker is gonna deduplicate them, right? So with this proposal, you could just say extern widget vtable, and then the compiler would say, okay, I know it's defined explicitly in exactly one place. So that's a small benefit. So now I'd like to go over um, a couple of tools that can allow us to, um, uh, to control, uh, to take a look at what our ABI surface is, and also control what the, um, uh, or rather detect uh, incompatible ABI changes, right? Which is really what we're interested in. Um, so unfortunately, there's not as much as we'd like, but I think a lot of people are working on tools and uh, we're making progress in that area. So the main tool, that, I mean, the first tool that, that I wanna talk about is NM. So if you don't already know about NM, um, it's definitely like one of the tools since I started working with shared libraries, it's one of the tools I use the most. Um, it allows you to uh, dump your symbol table. So the symbol table is basically the um, it is basically a list of all the functions that are that are in your in your shared object in your in your shared library, right? And with NM, you can actually get a list of them and the type they have. So you can know whether the whether they're external or whether they're you know internal to your shared library. So basically, whether they're visible or not, as far as uh, you know visibility is concerned. Uh, you get their name and then you get their type as well and what segment uh, they appear in. So for example, here I'm um, running NM on libc++ um, and I can see that I have something that looks like bad exception what something something in the first line and it says it's indirect. So the reason why it says it's indirect is because this is actually a symbol that is defined in another uh, shared library called libc++.dialib. And, um, and it's external. So basically, libc++ says, I provide that symbol, right? But the way I provide it is through this other shared library. And then a little below, we can see nested exception rethrow nested, um, which is also external, but that's in the text segment. So, um, so that's actually, that's a, an actual you know, function that is provided by the shared library itself. So by doing that, you can, you can go and um, and figure out basically what is your ABI surface? What, what, what are you providing to your uh, you know, users? Basically what functions are potentially uh, called from, from outside the dialib? And that's useful because if it does not appear in the dialib, then you can, or if it's not you know, exported from your dialib, that's when you know that you could potentially remove it. Um, and most people don't actually like writing, uh, reading the man uh, rather mangled names. So you can use C++ filled to solve that problem. Basically, C++ is, um is just great, right? You just throw anything at its face and it's just gonna demangle whatever it can. So um, in this case, you just pipe the output in C++ filled. It's gonna figure out, oh, this kinda looks like a mangled name and it's just gonna demangle it. So you can throw like arbitrary stuff you know, at it and as long as there are mangled names in it, it's gonna output the same thing with the, the names demangled. So this is absolutely great. There's also a dash dash demangle option to NM. Um, but C++ field is definitely uh, worth knowing about. It's really useful. And so another tool I want to talk about is um, ABI diff that comes from the libabigail package. Um, so that is a, a tool that has been devel developed at um, Red Hat, if I'm not mistaken. And what they've done is actually really cool. So it, the, the tool is really simple. Basically, you just say ABI diff one shared library, the other shared library, and then you get like, you know, a, um, a human readable output of like, what are the ABI differences between these two shared libraries, which is absolutely great. 
So you can just, um, you basically just, if you have, you know, your shared library and then you make some update to it and you want to know whether you've, you know, broken the ABI, you can, uh, you can just diff them. And then they're going to explain why you've broken the ABI if you've done so. Now, I don't know that they actually catch all problems. They, it's probably difficult to catch all problems. They probably don't, but it's still a really valuable tool, right? So if you care about your ABI, you should probably consider maybe in your CI, um, maybe you should consider having a step where you're running an ABI checker like that to, um, you know, to make sure that in between check-ins, you're not breaking your ABI. I think it's worth doing for sure. So in conclusion, um, I think, I hope I made a point that ABI stability is important. It's not always important, but when it is, it's, it's usually not a matter of whether you're too lazy to recompile your stuff or not. It's usually a matter of like, I literally cannot rebuild all the applications on my phone, right? Like, if, if you update your, your phone to a new OS and then you need to rebuild like all the applications, it just doesn't work. So, um, so sometimes it's really a matter of like, uh, correctness or functional, you know, functionality in your product. So when your when ABI stability represents something so important for you, it's really not something you can compromise on, right? And obviously, for some people that are really lucky to just control all their source code, then then they can go and recompile uh, everything, and they don't really have to care about ABI stability, which is a you know beautiful thing, beautiful world to be in, really. Um, so ABI stability is important, but it's really tricky to maintain. Uh, so it requires um, you know, making sure that you're not making any change that is going to break the ABI. Even if you're in a uh, setting where you're vending headers to your users, you have to put yourself in, in their shoes and figure out whether you've broken the, their ABI. So that's, that's really tricky. Um, but you have some tools that you can help, um, that can help you. And finally, I think it's worth mentioning that even though ABI stability has always been basically a, a feature of C++, right? So far, even though it's, it's not like an official stance, so far C, uh, ABI stability has been something that we have provided in, in C++. And, um, you know, we're really, we think it's really, really important. Recently, um, there's been, you know, discussion about maybe changing that policy a little bit or at least stating that policy explicitly. So um, I think it's going to be really interesting to see what we come up with. Um, I, think, I think that... Uh, it might be possible to get to some kind of middle ground where, you know, we can have some schedule for breaking the ABI, um, you know, some schedule that works for all vendors. Maybe that will, maybe we'll determine that it's not um, reasonable at all also, in which case we'll at least have stated explicitly that, no, no, we're not breaking the ABI, right? But I think it's, it's important to, um, to, uh, uh, to get basically to clear that question out because right now it's kind of a rampant question of like someone comes with a proposal and then I run into the, 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 the room where the proposal is being discussed and I'm like, oh, can't do that. That's an ABI break, right? And it's just annoying to do that. So it would be nice to have some kind of official policy on whether we're breaking it sometimes or not. So thank you very much. I hope you learned some stuff about, um, about ABIs.